I've been creating videos for my viewers and subscribers responding to the sorts of questions and, and wishes that they've been expressing that I talk more about my own philosophical formation and development and commitments, the, the people and ideas and movements that I'm particularly attracted to and, and find worth studying, if, if not necessarily endorsing. And um, phases that I also went through where maybe I, I jumped into something and and uh, eventually left it behind. Now, this one is about Hegel, that is uh, the great German idealist philosopher, Georg Hegel, right? And uh, he is somebody who I really didn't encounter until graduate school. Um, I mean, I, I did read a little bit of him as an undergraduate, but can't say that I understood anything that I read whatsoever. And I'll talk a bit about more, that in, in a bit. Um, but I, I, you know, he has become somebody who plays an important role in my, my own work and, and thought. I haven't published an awful lot on Hegel at, at, as, as of this point, unless you count um, creating videos, which I suppose is a sort of publication. Um, so this video is about somebody who I, I really see a lot of value to, um, but I, I'll admit is, is a very difficult thinker and um, somebody who I can't say that I totally understand inside and out and somebody who I disagree with on some, some really key issues. Um, so that makes him quite interesting for, for somebody like, like me. Um, so Hegel, how did I get started with Hegel in the first place? So, um, you know, I had read lots of references to Hegel because, you know, recent history from the 19th century on is just peppered with that sort of stuff. But as it turns out, most of the references in at any given time uh, usually are going to be somewhat misleading, which, you know, is something that Hegel himself could be telling us in his, his own work on, on history and, and consciousness and all these, these sorts of things. Um, so, you know, I went into undergraduate and um, while I was there, I had a really strange formation in part because the college that I went to, which no longer even has a philosophy program, um, had, had just a few people teaching philosophy, um, and both of them were, were older and, you know, really thought that existentialism when it came to continental philosophy was the cutting edge of, of things. And, and I, I did get introduced to more contemporary continental thought through a friend of mine um, who, who, in fact, lent me and, and then later on gave me a, a set of books. And I'll do a video about that sometime because that, that's a very interesting story as well. Um, and, you know, those thinkers were either using Hegel, the, the, these later thinkers, or they were saying the Hegelians have got things totally wrong. We don't want to be dialectical like them. And, you know, so I, what I was getting was a, sort of enough stuff to, you know, have opinions about Hegel, but not to actually know anything about, about what he was actually teaching. And I think this is very common for people. Um, you know, Kierkegaard, I knew, was, was against Hegel for some things. Nietzsche was against him for other things. Other existentialists were against him for yet other things. I was not at that time reading and understanding Heidegger, who actually thought Hegel was a very important philosopher. Um, I was reading Sartre, and Sartre uh, took some things from Hegel, so did de Beauvoir, and, and I, I thought that, well, that's pretty interesting stuff, but that turned out to be just the tiniest sliver of what's going on in Hegel's works. So, you know, that's undergraduate, and I was, you know, really interested in other things as well. And, and I had been introduced to this, this, you know, Hegelian dialectic that we teach people of, you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, the triadic structure that, that, by the way, in the very first part of the phenomenology, Hegel cautions us against schematizing triadic structures into something like a map for, for everything. Um, but I, I really didn't, couldn't say I understood anything about Hegel until I got to graduate school. Then, when I was in graduate school, you know, I went through various other uh, phases, and I was, you know, I was spending time, um, you know, looking at things in the philosophy of language, both analytic and continental, and doing a lot of, you know, uh, studying languages for their own sake. 
uh, because of the kind of school that I went to where we had a pluralistic department and a very robust comprehensive examination at the master's level and a very robust set of prelim examinations at the PhD level, you had to read some Hegel, but that didn't necessarily mean that you understood anything. Now, the, the people that I was reading who were, were um, using Hegel and who really, in my view, knew what they were up to, I'd mentioned Sartre before, but I took a class on Maurice Merleau-Ponty, uh, and I also took a class on Theodore Adorno. Adorno is a thinker who I would say whose writings are of equal complexity and difficulty to those of Hegel, but who doesn't have the sort of, you know, let's bring it all to a resolution the way that, that Hegel does. Um, and I was pretty fascinated by this stuff. My German was, was quite good at the time. So when there was a Hegel class offered, a, a graduate seminar in, in Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, um, I went to our wonderful SIU library, which I, I didn't realize just how great it was at the time as a research library, and I found a second edition in, in the German, in the Fraktur, the old German script, of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, you know, the Phenomenologie des, des Geistes. And... Um, I, uh, I brought that to class, and an older, I, I didn't actually go to the bookstore and buy this version, this translation, I just brought the, the, the older um, translation, the Bailey one, along, and I was reading it in the German during, during the class. Um, I did that actually, too, by the way, I should mention for being in time as well. And so, you know, while people were going over things, I would be the guy who'd be like, well, that's not exactly what it's saying in that, that passage there. The translation's a little bit loose. And I was, I was pretty fascinated with, with Hegel. I really, um, I really took to his, his thought and enjoyed it. And, um, you know, I, I ended up writing my paper, if I remember right, not just on the master-slave dialectic, but doing somewhat of a, you know, Derridian deconstructive thing with it, talking about how, how it couldn't be blown up into the rest of the phenomenology, which is quite true, right? And what else was, was going on in terms of power relations and, and meaning and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, and so, you know, it was a great semester. Uh, the professor was Stephen Timon, who is, you know, when it comes to German idealism, was really a, a uh, uh, diamond in the rough. Um, he hadn't published a lot, but he was a really, you know, great professor. Um, I imagine probably still is because he's, he's, he's still down there teaching at Southern Illinois University, but now he's, he's been freed up to do quite a bit more of the, the stuff that I think he would like to do. And um, he was really, uh, you know, he, what, what was great about it was Timon was not committed to um, Hegel has to be right about everything and I need to be either a Hegelian partisan or I need to be a Hegelian critic, right? He was much more willing to say, well, what, you know, let's, let's see what's going on in this section and does it, does it you know, make sense and, and could we see the world in this way and what would that look like? And he, do, he did the sort of presentation that um, I myself admired, somebody who really understood the text, somebody who could bring in other connections, and also when graduate students would go off on flights of fancy, including myself, could rein us back in. So, you know, after that, I was pretty hooked. And, and like a lot of people, I think, who, who study Hegel, particularly those who come at it through the phenomenology, as opposed to, you know, the system with a capital S, which would be like, the, you know, the encyclopedia logic or, um, you know, uh, the, the corpus as a whole, um, science of logic, you don't quite see so much of that. I was um, going through that, that period where I was, you know, looking at things very dialectically and trying to see if I could fit things into the Hegelian framework. And so were a lot of my classmates. My, my classmates were mostly, I, I thought, interested in framing things in terms of the master-slave dialectic, uh, in part because that's, that's one of the more easy and accessible portions of the, the phenomenology and it doesn't require you to do you know quite so much stretching because every society you can find some people on top some people on the bottom 
Um, but that's only just like a little bit of what's going on in the phenomenology. Uh, I was much more captivated by Hegel's discussions of action and how we make choices and all these other dialectics, which seem to fit in well with what I was you know, remembering from, from Sartre and also to a certain extent from, from Nietzsche. Uh, I've always had a, a strong interest in, in questions of, you know, determinism and will and, and you know, choices and action and what, what's going on and, and whether, you know, whether uh, we can sort of predict what's going to happen or whether it remains less or unpredictable. So all of that was really, you know, that, that's the stuff that's there in the reason section and the spirit section. Really great stuff. Um, the religion section I also was very interested in as well because I was myself um, going through a, uh, a period in which I had, you know, um, I was studying a lot of religious authors and engaging in a lot of uh, religious discussion and, and even doing some practices. Slowly myself coming back to the church that I had left as a teenager. Uh, but now in a very different way, in a part through reading philosophy. And I wanted to see whether Hegel's narrative really held up or, you know, whether it was whether it told us a story that was partly uh, explanatory, it partly opened our eyes to things, but but also obscured things. And so I wrote an article about that, that I, it came from a conference presentation that I'll link to here. And... Um, yeah, so that, that goes on. Then, you know, around the same time, we also had a reading group for students on the phenomenology. So we'd already had the class. Now we wanted to, as a bunch of students, there were about, you know, 12 or 13 of us, get together every week and go back through the phenomenology ourselves. And that's what we did. And I, I led a couple uh, sections of that. I'll actually, I think I may have a um, document from that uh, from that time that I created and then updated a little bit later on for my half hour Hegel fans uh, about the uh, consciousness section, um, including the master slave dialectic. And um, I, I led them through that. I led them through the religion section. Um, other people led through other things. And it was really quite, quite a, a, a great time. And I, I found that that having studied Hegel um, was, even if I didn't buy into his his whole package, you could say, and, and over time I bought into less and less of the package, um, he was incredibly useful, not just for understanding all these references that were being made by other French and German and sometimes Italian thinkers, um, and I say sometimes Italian because I, I didn't read quite so many Italian thinkers, just a few compared to French and German thinkers. Um, but it was also useful. Some of his dialectics, you can see them, you can see them playing themselves out in various uh, dynamics that people have, whether in their personal lives or in politics, you know, writ, writ large in cultural developments. Um, there's a lot of, studying things in a Hegelian way, I think is a good preparation for understanding how things often do end up working. Um, so it provides a useful mode of analysis. Um, somebody who I, I was very interested in, who, who wrote in such a way was uh, the defense analyst, uh, Edward Lutbach. Um, who wrote a book, Strategy, the Logic of War and Peace, which is based on a, di a dialectical uh, sort of analysis of, of uh, weapon systems and responses and all that sort of stuff. So um, not surprisingly, given that, that somebody who he was influenced by, Clausewitz was influenced by Hegel, um, or at least I, I, <laughs> I certainly believe so. Um, so g going on a bit further... I was actually going to write my dissertation on Hegel. Uh, well, originally I was going to write it on Derrida. And then I went to Stephen Tymon and I said, I'm thinking about writing my, my dissertation on Derrida. And he said something that I'm sure some of my viewers are going to disagree with, um, but I, I think is actually really good advice. He said, you know, you don't want to write your dissertation on somebody who's just going to be a footnote in the history of philosophy down the line. 
um, right on somebody who's really at the center of things, you know, um, like Heidegger, you know, instead of Derrida, you know, pick pick Heidegger. People are still going to be talking about him. Or why don't you do, since you like him so much, why don't you do Hegel? And I thought, well, yeah, OK, I could I could do some stuff on Hegel, really on Hegel and, and religion. Now, at the same time, I was getting heavily into Maurice Blondel, oftentimes called the French Hegel or the Catholic Hegel. Uh, who very is who really is very similar in many respects in his modes of analyses and syntheses to Hegel, although he had not read the phenomenology, just read the the logic. Um, that was his introduction to to Hegel. And when I when I went to get ready for my dissertation, two things happened. One was I had to take a special thinkers exam. We had to take five preliminary or four preliminary <laughs> exams. I don't know why I said five. Four. One was on uh, metaphysics and philosophy of religion. So there was some Hegel in there, right? One was on epistemology and philosophy of science. So some Hegel in there as well. And one was on what we call value fields, which meant ethics, aesthetics, and political theory. And there was also some Hegel in there. But I had to also take a special thinkers exam. And your special thinker is the person you're supposed to be writing your dissertation on. So, long story short, I, I, I decided, well, I'll do it on Hegel, right? And I went to Stephen Timon, who I knew was probably going to be the chair of the committee, and I said, well, um, what do you want me to do to prepare for this? And he said, well, um, just, uh, you know, memorize all the dialectics and the phenomenology, and you should be good. And, and maybe some parts of the science of logic as well. <laughs> And I said, do I need to read any any secondary literature in particular? And he said, I'd read what you like. You know, we're probably not going to ask you about that. We're going to ask you about Hegel because we're more interested in you being able to talk, you know, constructively about Hegel than in what this guy thought or that guy thought or that guy thought. We're, 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 we really want you to focus on, on the thinker himself. So I did it and I took it. And I, I if I remember right, I actually got a high pass. Uh, in part because I could, you know, I'd memorize like large, large portions of German text that I then managed to regurgitate. There's no way I could do that now. Um, so I passed that. And then I decided, well, I wanted to actually write a dissertation, not just on Hegel, but on Hegel as one bookend and Maurice Blondel on the other end. And then I would also have like a chapter on Kierkegaard and a chapter on Marx and say that, you know, look, Kierkegaard and Marx represent two really interesting uh, ways of, of appropriating dialectical philosophy against Hegel, Blondell manages to do what both of them do better in many respects. And so, you know, we'll, we'll look at his works. And so I went into my, my um, you know, you write a prospectus and you go into your committee meeting and the committee uh, sent me out. And then when they brought me in, they were like, well, this is really too ambitious. Uh, and I thought they were going to say like, forget the Blondell stuff. And they're like, it's really clear you like Blondell. Do you think you want to write a dissertation on him? It's probably not going to get you hired the way a Hegel dissertation might, but you, you, you probably would enjoy it a lot. And I said, yeah, okay, I'll write a dissertation just on Blondell then. And that's what I did. Um, there's a whole story to be told about that. There's a whole separate video. You know, you know I don't need to, to go into all of that. So, you know, over time, I, I was doing less and less with Hegel. Um, I would still read him, you know, and I had the intention of doing some writing after I graduated um, and was, you know, working in Indiana, um, you know, and doing some some other stuff. But I never managed. I, I actually had a lot of notes and I, I got some papers halfway started, but I never managed to bring them off and, and get them ready for publication. Um, down the line, you know, I, I would teach Hegel occasionally in, um, I would teach some things in intro classes, and then I would also teach Hegel when we got to um, uh, contemporary philosophy, and I would do continental philosophy classes. And, um, you know, that was enjoyable, but you really, it was just getting your feet wet. It's, it's difficult, of course, with Hegel. Uh, to just have a little tiny bit of time to talk about him because there's there's so much going on there. Now, later on, and this is going to bring us much closer to the present, um, when I was uh, still adjuncting and, and trying to build, you know, the, the reason I owe business, and there's plenty more I could say about that, um, I was, I was uh, you know, doing these YouTube videos, and people 
at first I was just doing course videos, right? Things directly from my, my uh, intro and ethics and those sorts of courses. And people were like, hey, man, can you do some other stuff? Uh, I'd really like to see, and, the, and I, you know, I started seeing a lot more requests. And so I put out like a poll and I said, well, who do you really, really want to see? And there were four people who came up. So Sartre, Heidegger, Hegel, and Marcuse. So I started doing that existentialism series that I never quite did finish. I still have to do that. There's about 40 or 50 videos in that. And that took care of a lot of the Sartre and Heidegger. And then I thought, you know, I, I, I should do something on Hegel. And I started thinking, well, how, how can I do this? You know, it's not like reading parts of Sartre's work or, you know, articles by, by Heidegger where I can I can do some summarization, but I, I you know, I don't have to like uh, go really, really close to the text, you know, line by line. But Hegel, you know, I don't know if I can summarize him effectively. I'm sure there's people out there who could do it, but, but you know, I'm, I don't know that I can. So I decided to start the Half Hour Hegel series. That is about three years ago. And, you know, I thought, well, half an hour, that's about enough Hegel for one sitting. That's about as much as a, a, I think a person can take in, certainly with me, like talking at that chalkboard about it. And so I, I started, you know, doing that, going through it paragraph by paragraph, line by line, a, a commentary, uh, the sort of thing that actually hadn't been done unless you count David Harvey's uh, reading Marx uh, lectures. There is now actually something sort of like that being done for the science of logic, but I haven't had the chance to take a look at those videos yet because, of course, I'm rather busy. So, you know, that was three years ago, and I decided uh, fairly early on to start crowdfunding it because it was taking up quite a bit of my time. And I thought that, um, you know, it was, you know, important to have some sort of remuneration. Uh, it's nowhere near the compensation for the amount of time that I put in, but it is very nice that there are people who want to support it. And it's, you know, it's gotten a bit of uh, publicity here and there. Um, lots and lots and lots of views, which is very gratifying. There are many people worldwide who have used these videos to, to make sense out of, out of Hegel's phenomenology. So, um, you know, where, where are things going from now? Um, well, I, I still have probably another two years worth of video production to do. We, we've gotten to the halfway point of this work, which is great. But now we have uh, a lot more to do. I'm doing about six videos a month in the Half Hour Hegel series. And it's, it's probably about time that I start knuckling down and doing some academic writing about Hegel and, and doing a bit of publishing. I did, you know, write on him a bit in an encyclopedia entry that I wrote on, on 19th century philosophy. But I think there's, there's more that I, I could be doing in, in that respect. Um, but all of that depends on um, the factor of time, if I can find the time to, to do that. I'll certainly be reading him and rereading him the rest of my life. He is somebody who I see as a, a thinker who, um, it's not just the content of what he's doing, it's, it's the way he's doing it. He's sort of in, in a progression <clears throat> that, you know, Aristotle is in, Thomas Aquinas, um, Hegel, I would say somebody like Alistair McIntyre, uh, you know, in, in the present, where they're taking, uh, they're taking, you know, lots and lots of things from all different vectors and, and trying to have a uh, rather ambitious grasp and then synthesizing uh, the best out of that. And in the case of Hegel and McIntyre, looking to historical development, trying to make sense out of our own times. So I think that is really uh, something quite, quite remarkable. And um, Hegel is, is, is one of you know, my, my favorite thinkers. I wouldn't say that I am a Hegelian. Uh, I, I'm, I'm an eclectic blending together a number of things, but that means that I do draw quite a bit from Hegel when I find him useful. So that's the story of how I got into Hegel and why he's still important and, you know, a little bit about the, the projects that I'm engaged with.